we know we need to assess risks. We know that we're going to get information and that we need to take a look at that information and assess the risks of material misstatement, right? So what are the risks of material misstatement? The challenge for a lot of students, and understandably so, is just how do you do that? How are you supposed to assess risks? Now, to a large extent, a lot of this will come with experience. As you are dealing with information, as you're dealing with companies, as you're dealing with situations, you start realizing um, the risks that are inherent in situations because of your experience, because you've done something and then you saw the consequence of that. Without going through that experience, it's quite difficult to foresee consequences of stuff and to look at information and go, ah, oh, um, this sentence or this information is going to cause that particular problem. In most cases, it's only really when we experience something ourselves or we're told the connection or we go through it, do we realize, oh, okay, if this happens, then that's going to be the outcome. So risk assessment for students is pretty complicated, right? It seems we understand the concept, like I know what I'm supposed to do, but to a large extent, what students end up doing is saying, okay, I'm going to remember um, the situation and say, you know, the next time that I see information like that, then that's the risk that goes with it. So to a large extent, uh, students will learn risks as a database of if I see this, then that is the result, or that will be the risk. If I see these words, then that will be the risk. And that becomes increasingly challenging when you deal with more complex case studies um, and information that you haven't seen before. So we're gonna talk about how on earth do you assess the risk? I'm gonna start, I'm gonna help you start this process by giving you what I call categories of risks. Okay. If you will, these are kind of your most common reasons that risks take place. The most common reasons for risks of material misstatements. Yeah. You're not going to find this in a textbook somewhere. This is not a comprehensive list. This is not a fix all everything. This is very much, and I really want you to understand, this is a starting point to help you to learn how to think about risks, how to process this information, and how to start understanding how risk assessment works for yourself, instead of always having to say, I can only do risk assessment if I've seen that specific thing before. If I've never dealt with that sentence before, then I won't be able to do it. Okay, so this is very much a starting point for your learning of how to assess risks. So really good. As you learn and as you develop, you're going to potentially add to this list or you may disagree with how I've structured it. That's fine. But this is a starting point to get you going so that you can learn how to do this on your own. And I will explain to you how to use this to improve your risk assessment as we go, both from an exam technique point of view, as well as practically. You know, this is not limited to exam technique. This is this is practical as well. So let's begin. All righty. Our biggest reasons or our categories, common reasons for risks. Our first one, in no particular order, it's difficult. Okay? Anything that is difficult is more likely to result in errors. If something is hard, it's more likely that people are going to get it wrong. If it's something that is complicated, if it's something that you as an accounting student may struggle with, then definitely there's an increased risk that your client is going to struggle with it. So difficulty, if something is difficult, there's a higher chance that it may result in a risk of material misstatement. I'll go into each of these in a little bit more detail as we go, but to start with, these are just the categories. If something is new or if it's once off. 
anything that is new has a higher risk of being incorrect because we don't know what to do with it. Whether this is a new staff member, a new system, a new transaction, a new anything. Anything that's new is more likely to be treated incorrectly purely because we've never done it before and we don't know what's going on. So if your client has got anything new, there's a possibility that there's going to be errors in there. If something is once off, it means that they don't do it normally. It's not usual, it's not part of their routine, it's not something that they're used to doing, which means there's more likely to be some kind of error in whatever it is that they're doing. If something is subjective, it means that it is subject to someone's opinion, someone's estimation, someone's judgment, which means that there's no way that you're going to find a specific hard and fast black and white yes or no right or wrong answer for that, which makes it harder for you to prove whether or not that item is right or wrong. It makes it easier to manipulate that particular area to give you the answer that you want. So if your client has anything in those financial statements that is subjective, you can't sit and go, well, that is absolutely right or that is absolutely wrong. Why? Because, well, that's your opinion. My opinion is that this building is worth X. Your opinion is that that building is worth Y. Who's right and who's wrong? It is subjective. Therefore, there is a higher risk that it may be misstated. If there is some kind of legal requirement relating to this particular item, transaction, balance, etc., then there is more likelihood that we're going to worry about it. There is an increased importance in this particular issue because there is a legal requirement behind it. Um, you know, it makes it, in a lot of cases, it may make this particular item material by nature, which means even if it is a very small amount, it might be material because just because it's now illegal for you to have done that, even though it's only worth a tiny amount. So anything that has a legal requirement increases the possibility of risk. One, because you got to make, there's a higher there's a higher level of importance attached to it, but also because in a lot of cases, um, legal issues become more complicated, which means it's less likely that people know about it or treat it correctly. If there's an ISA for this, and I'm talking here especially your evidence chapters from ISA 500 onwards, if there is an auditing standard for this, there is a higher likelihood that there may be a risk of material misstatement. The auditing standards have been written and designed for a specific reason. Each of them are there as a result of a vulnerability that the auditor faces. Every single auditing standard that's there is there to say to the auditor, look, we know that this particular area is kind of tricky. It's a little hard to prove that it's right or wrong. So we're going to give you guidance about how you should do it the best way to do this when you come across these particular areas because they're kind of weird. So if there is an auditing standard relating to some kind of any information that you come across at your client, you want to be extra aware of that because if there's an auditing standard, it means that there's some kind of weirdness about that area, which increases the risk that something may have gone wrong. If it's weird and it's tricky and it's odd and it's something that the auditing standards have said, let's help you with this, it's because it's more likely to have gone wrong. And that we will go through that we will go through in more detail as well. Specific IFRS requirements. If there are IFRS requirements for a transaction and account balance, if those are quite specific, and especially on top of that, if they're quite complex, then there is an increased chance that they're going to be misstated. Does your client know what's going on with IFRS? Do, do they know the disclosure requirements? Do they know the recognition requirements? Do they know the measurement requirements? Do they understand how each of these IFRS, do they understand how each of the, these transactions are governed by IFRS and do they know what these requirements are? So if there are specific IFRS requirements around transactions or account balances, you need to understand and you need to know what they are. The more complicated and the more tricky they are, 
the more likely that your client may have gotten them wrong. Fraud as a risk, fraud as a risk of material misstatement um, is an interesting one and this comes, there is a specific standard for this, ISA 240. I've put this in here because there are three categories or there are three uh, there are three things that you need to be aware of when you're considering fraud. We don't jump into, when we're going, when we audit our client, we don't jump to the conclusion that our client is guilty of fraud purely because they're management. There are three things that give us an indication that fraud might be taking place. One, we look for incentives. If there is an incentive to commit fraud, it means that if you do X, Y, Z, there is a higher possibility of getting more money, uh, you know, getting some kind of payback for this, or reducing the possibility of getting into trouble. So an incentive is either, you know, some kind of reward, either some kind of reward or avoiding punishment. So is there an incentive to achieve or to receive some kind of reward or is there an incentive to avoid punishment? Because the higher each of those are, the more likely that management might commit fraud. Incentive on its own is not the only indicator of possible fraud. There also needs to be the opportunity there may be a very high incentive to commit fraud, but if there is zero opportunity to do so, then even though uh, the possibility or even though in the incentive is there, it's not going to happen because it just, it can't, it's impossible. If there is an incentive to commit fraud and there is an opportunity to do so as well, because perhaps the person who uh, perhaps the person who's going to benefit from the fraud is the person who's doing the financials themselves, then there's absolutely an opportunity for them to do that. No one's checking on them. No one's asking them what's going on. They're in absolute control. They have full autonomy. Then they can do what they like. They have both the incentive as well as the opportunity. And the third thing that we look at is the justification or the rationale behind it. So um, in this case, we're talking about if I, uh, if I just hide this, then I'll be able to fix it later. Or you know, if people know that I'm in trouble, then they'll remove their financial support for me and then I'll really be in trouble. So if I just hide it for a little bit, I'll work my way out of it and then nobody needs to know and then we'll all be fine. I'll put the money back. Um, you know, as soon as I can, and then everything's going to be okay. So these are three indicators of possible fraud, if you will. So when we look at fraud, we're looking for incentives, opportunities, and justifications or rationales. These are our starting points.